What's up, Internet? Uh, the GM is inconsolable after he found out that magic item pricing didn't didn't really happen the way we all wanted it to, and he just... It's really all he wanted in life, so we're we're all pitching in for his therapy session today instead. So, session's canceled. Might be next week and the week after that. We'll see how he makes... You know, we'll see how he gets through it. Wait, what the shit? I'm kind of inconsolable about that. What the fuck? I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought they solved this problem. How um, could they do this uh, to me? I mean, I mean, spoiler for for when we get to there, but uh, the, the pricing is not per item. It's just per rarity. That's it. God damn it. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody's happy. Uh. It's right, also, well, I got to wait the, for uh, Jacob from the XP to level three to do it him damn self again. <laughs> I, I I also think that the the prices might be on the upper range from when they were in the 2014 version, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Like, don't quote me, but they they might hmm. be. Uh, I'm just, I'm just find. Uh, Let's see. So legendary was fifty thousand plus in twenty fourteen. We're just going right into it, apparently. Um, let's see. Legendary was fifty thousand plus. Let's see what legendary is in twenty. Pretty sure it's more than that. Uh, this is how you vamp for time by making noises with your mouth while you flip through the book to try and find the thingy you're looking for. <laughs> oh my God! It's in here somewhere. God damn it! I know I'm close. Where the there it is. Found it. Oh Jesus Christ, dude! You know there's a, you know there's a problem when my, my brain was like, just Control F for it. Oh, he has an actual book. Control F the book, Control F the physical book I am yep. holding. Um, yeah. Yep. So a legendary item, a legendary item in 2014 would have cost you 50,000 GP. Take a guess what it cost you in, in 2024. 75,000. Higher. 80? Higher. Dog. 95? <laughs> Higher. Dog. 100? <laughs> Higher? Brother. <laughs> Fucking Keep high going. is it? Keep going. 150. Higher. <laughs> You got me so fucked up. I can't. I can't. I'm um, no. 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 200,000. You got me fucked up. I can't. Uh. There's no fucking way. <laughs> yep. Yep. A uh, magic item, legendary, 200,000, and then 100,000 if you craft it. Uh, but obviously, that's going to take a while. <laughs> Just, just for gits and shiggles. Uh -huh. do, do they list dragon hordes in there? N n uh, n treasure hordes, not dragon hordes specifically. Uh, they still have the okay, like treasure hordes from CR stuff in here. I forget where I saw it, but I, I definitely saw it. Uh, but not dragon hordes specifically. Um, but you can still use the fizz band one. Is bands ones. I have to check on those because I, I got to see what what they expect to you for you to get from a dragon's horde. The fizz band. So here's what I'll say about the fizz bands, dragon hordes. I, hi, everyone. We're talking about I, I acquired the we the, the <laughs> Jesus Christ. The 2024 DMG is out now. It's out at your local game store. It's not out at big box retailers like Barnes and Noble or Walmart or Target. Uh so dude, we're going to talk about the new DMG. That's that's what we're doing today. We have no notes. No plan. We're just running on vibes today. That's that's how I'm feeling. You know? And oh, if that sounds appealing to you, <laughs> if that feels appealing to you, you should follow or subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're currently listening on for the vibes. Yes, please do that. Do you remember like a hundred uh, episodes when you would come out with the really thought out scripts and things and I would just be like, I don't know, we're, I'll figure it out 10 minutes before we record. 
I mean, I had a plan. It's not like I didn't have a plan. I just didn't. I, I thought about like trying to write notes and like read through carefully and stuff. But I was like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, there's no like, Fair enough. we're not doing it. It's not a review. We're not reviewing it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, what I, what I was saying was that, yes, the the dragon hordes in fizz bands are fucking ridiculous amounts of money, especially if you fight like an ancient dragon. So those things kind of line up. Honestly, okay. I've reduced. So the dragon horde that you guys got when you fought um, a dragon whose name I forgot. Something the black psyche. Oh, I don't remember either. Yeah, I don't remember I don't his name. <laughs> Kygaros, something like that. Kygaros, yeah. Uh, the hordes you got from him, I actually reduced the amount of money that was in it. <laughs> I actually took some out because it was so much. So, I see. Yeah. Do with that what you will. Um. But yes, there are st- there are the like layer stuff. Where is it? There, uh, combat exploration, blah blah blah, to environment. The fuck's the encounter building spot? Objective. Oh, adventure reward. Is it? Uh, no, it wasn't that. Was it that? Was it that? I feel like it wasn't. Maybe it was. Was it elf? Perhaps. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out real quick because now I'm curious. Where the thing is. Okay, here's the builder, monster relations, attitudes, initial attitudes, random encounters. Ah, okay. So a random treasure hoard. So from CR 0 to 4, and a treasure hoard being like, you know, something in their lair or whatever. 2d4 yep. times 100 GP with 1d4 minus 1 magic items. From CR 5 to 10, 8D10 times 100 GP with an average of 4,400 GP. Uh, 1D3 magic items. Uh, 11 to 6 is 8D8 times 10,000 GP or an average of 36,000 GP. Oh my god. Which is a lot. Uh, And then, so at level 17 plus, I mean, here you go. 6D10 times 10,000 GP in a treasure hoard of a random, <laughs> like, think, uh, you know, oh, a random lore monster, which which average average number, because they, they give you the roll and then the average, if you want to just take the average, 330,000 GP. So that covers a legendary magic item and also it, 1D6 magic items in at level 17 plus. So the math does, like, keep up. Um... This is also worth pointing out that they've added more things to sink gold on in general uh, via bastions, as well as some other stuff like poisons. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's more gold sinks and it, you know, there's the set magic item prices and stuff. So like, yeah, it checks out. See? Yeah. I mean, shit. At level 17 plus for a random individual, 2d8 times 100 platinum pieces. So, you know, add another zero on there for gold. So, yeah. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So. (laughs) For those listening, you may know this may this may be a little awkward because Isaiah wasn't there for the episode, but we talked about what the new DMG was going to be a little bit already in the video that Wizards of the Coast gave us. So now that I physically have the DMG, we can see if they were dirty, filthy liars or if they were mostly on the mark in that, what they said in that video. Uh, the sort of opening thing that Perkins said in that video was that this new DMG, he wants to be the quote unquote, the DM's best friend. And another thing that they really wanted to focus on was this DMG being really good if you've never run the game or even played, honestly. Like, if you have never run D&D or played D&D or you've done it very little, this new DMG, the objective was to make it way more helpful to you as that new player and new dungeon master. In comparison to the 2014 DMG, which was 
fucking dog shit at introducing you to the game. <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to report that, yeah, I would say this new DMG is absolutely going to be exponentially better for new players. 100%. That's good. That's great. Yes, mission accomplished, as far as I can tell. Um, they also talked about it being in a more intuitive order, which they told us the chapter order in the in the video. But for your sake, Isaiah, chapter one is the basics. Chapter two is running the game. Chapter three is called the D the DM's toolbox, which is all of those various little bits and bobs that aren't necessarily the core focus, but come up from time to time that you need to adjudicate or like, you know, like for example, in the DM's toolbox is the hazard section and the traps section, right? That kind of shit. And then chapter four is creating adventures. Chapter four is creating campaigns at the, sorry, chapter five is creating campaigns at the, at the end of chapter five is the Greyhawk setting. Uh, chapter six is the cosmology shit, which I don't give a flying sh ass about, but some people care. It's only eight pages anyway. <laughs> I just chapter quick, seven. I is, like that you went from flying fuck to flying shit to like flying. Ass. Start yeah, working real time in your yeah. head. <laughs> chapter seven is the one everybody's going to jack off to, which is of course the treasure chapter, and then chapter mm -hmm. eight is the bastions chapter. Um, and I don't know if you remember, Isaiah, they talked about a secret extra chapter. Remember that early on? Yes. Yeah. So I, I guess that was the lore glossary. Apparently. Oh, yes. I wonder the what all the fucking secrecy was about. Uh, I don't know. But as far as I can tell, because chapter eight is Bastions, which was not a secret. So after that's the lore glossary. And yeah, I guess it was just supposed to be a fun surprise. Like, hey, we're putting in a Lord Glossary. Uh, yeah. It's not huge, but there's some bits and bobs in there. It's kind of fun. I'm a little disappointed okay. by the Lord Glossary, but you know, whatever. All right. By its existence or the lack of stuff? Uh, It's not as meaty as I would have liked. Similar to okay. the... 2024 player's handbook this dmg although it is technically more pages i'm pretty sure is less words because there's a lot more tables there's a lot more art there's a lot more massive pieces of art that aren't just like little corner bits you know um mm -hmm. so yeah i would have liked a little more meatiness there but it's cool that it exists uh but there are you know, I mean, D&D &D lore is ludicrously massive, so it's not like you can get everything. You know, it's just a primer, because if you really want all of that juicy, meaty information, you're going to have to go online and, you know, dive the wikis and shit to get everything. Um, but, you know, it's a little primer. So, yeah. Oh, and then after the glossary is uh, uh, they have a bunch of maps, just like random they have a Barrow Crypt, a Caravan Encampment, Crossroad Village, Dragon's Lair, Dungeon Hideout, Farmstead, Keep, Manor, Mine, Roadside Inn, Ship, Spooky House, Underdark Warren, Volcano ca Caves, and a Wizard Tower. And those are just maps uh, chilling in the back. And they, That's pretty you know, dope. They look, uh, they look what you, what you would expect. You know, they have the, the, like, uh, that D&D map look to them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, those are cool. I mean, as someone who plays on a virtual tabletop, I don't, you know, them being physically in the book, not super helpful, but I'm sure someone will put them online in some capacity and then I could probably use them. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you'll probably get something like that on Roll20. I would imagine, yes. I mean, actually, if you probably if you buy the DMG on Roll20, they will probably include these maps, I would think. That's what I meant. Oh, the Dragon's Lair one's cool. Interesting. OK, cool. I mean, I won't look at these too much because obviously no point in me trying to describe maps. 
Yeah, I was, uh, yeah I'm just gonna sit here and, and, and imagine what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna. Yeah, both for your sake and anyone listening, I'm not gonna like describe them. Uh, chapter one is the basics. Um, chapter one has a lot of what you would expect. I will say, if you are a, you know, a, a, a veteran DM, or not even really, if you're a like. If you run even one or two campaigns, chapter one's probably not going to be very useful to you because it is when they say the basics, they mean the basics. I mean, it talks about the actor, the director, the improviser, the referee, like what your role is as a GM. They talk about embrace the shared story. It's not a competition. It's okay to make mistakes. Communicate with your players like really basic shit. They give you suggestions on Mm -hmm. note taking um, finding players. They mention going to hobby stores, friends and family, gaming clubs at school, social media and messaging sites, gaming conventions. You know, they tell you how to find players. Uh, oh, wow. I didn't see this. As the dungeon master, you need this book plus the player's handbook, which contains most of the rules for the game and the monster manual. Your players need access to the player's handbook too, but they can share as needed. Let players know beforehand what books they can reference during a play session. For example, it's not appropriate for players to look up a monster in the monster manual or the equivalent digital tool while fighting that monster. If you're running a published adventures, players should avoid reading the adventures so they don't spoil any surprises. So like they even talk about what books you actually need, right? So this is like when they said the basics, they weren't kidding. I will, I will so say, something I find is interesting is that they are openly declaring that you need the dungeon master's guide. They are declaring it, yes. And I would say... And that's. Well, yeah, finish that thought. I was going to say, that's not a bad thing. It's I'm happy that they're finally taking firm stances. Yes, I mean, I think they kind of said that before, too, but they really, really put a lot of emphasis on this DMG being genuinely useful. And I do think it is more useful than the old one. I mean, I haven't read every single word or anything because I just got it yesterday. But like it definitely on the face of it already. I can already see its value, even as someone who's run the game, you know, quite a bit. So I would say mission accomplished. Um, Are there things that I would like more of in the book? Yes. But I have a feeling there's certain things that had to get cut to save like space you know like oh we can only have so many we only have so many pages or whatever yada yada um and it's it's worth pointing out as i me and matt did this before have you ever looked at the uh chapter layout of the old dmg one the 24 the no okay Uh, i mean i'm sure i have but do, uh, do i remember in any specific detail no not at all so this is how wild and like this is how ridiculous this old dmg was Chapter one, a world of your own. Tells you how to build a world. Chapter two, creating a multiverse. (laughs) Those are the first two chapters in the 2014 DMG. Yeah. Chapter three, creating adventures. Chapter four, creating NPCs. Chapter five, environment, uh, adventure environments. Chapter six, between adventures. Chapter seven, treasure. Chapter eight, running the game. Chapter eight. Why? Bro, I wish I could tell you. There's a reason nobody used this old DMG. Wow. Chapter eight is running the game. And then chapter nine is the Dungeon Master's Workshop, which has a lot of the like, you know, the optional rules and the creating spells and creating monsters and shit. Yeah. So, uh. That, yeah, the old one was just, especially if you're like a new DM and you were trying to read front to back, like you want to read it, you know, properly as a book. Chapter, you're going to get through all the magic items. Of chapter seven, your brain's going to be fucking cooked and you still don't know how to run this shit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy. So they have fixed that with 5e24. Um... Also, this one, so this one, I think, is actually something that even if you've done, uh, you know, a lot of GMing, I think is quite useful. They talk about prepping. 
uh, and they say that the they have the one hour guideline. A D&D game session usually starts out starts with some out of character chatter as everyone settles down. Once the session gets underway, most groups can accomplish at least three things during one hour of play where each thing might be any of the following. Explore a location such as a chamber in a castle or a cave. Converse with an intelligent creature. Reach a consensus on a divisive issue. Solve a tricky riddle or puzzle. Survive a deadly trap. Fight a low difficulty combat encounter. A more difficult combat encounter might count as two or three things, and a tense negotiation might use most or all of an hour of play on its own. So that's a really good primer for pacing. Like, just just very general uh, pacing advice. You'd be like, yeah. I, I also think it's particularly interesting that it says, fight a low difficulty combat encounter, right? Mm -hmm. Specifically calling out don't try to cram a high difficulty fight into a single hour because it's probably not happening, especially if you're doing like a one shot. Um, and then it talks about prepping. After, so it talks about what they can do in an hour and then it talks about prepping. So if you have one hour of preparation, it says focus on the story of the adventure, read and reread the introduction, background information, bolded list of key plot points. Identify the encounters you want to run, figure out how likely it is an encounter will get played, categorize each one as definite, possible, or unlikely for the encounters. And then it says, step three, gather any maps you'll need for the, for the definite and possible encounters, then focus on the remainder of your prep time on the definite encounters as outlined. For combat encounters, review stat blocks, note any special rules. For social encounters, make some notes about the NPCs. For exploration, record any clues. Uh, step four, consider how definite encounters relate to player motivations. Think about elements you can add to interest them. Uh, for example, a combat encounter could open with a tense negotiation designed to appeal to players who enjoy social interaction. Skim the encounters you flagged as possible. That's if you have an hour. If you have two hours, carefully review each possible encounter. Devote any time you have left to creating improvisational aids. If you have three hours of prep, Skim each unlikely encounter, create a new encounter designed to appeal specifically to one player or alter an existing encounter to relate to the goals and motivations of that player character. Over the course of several sessions, do this for all your players and their characters. Uh, that's like good. That's a very good way to lay out session prep. Yeah, seriously, I, I wish... I kind of had information as streamlined as this. Yeah, it's very streamlined running. and it's and it's described in a fashion that you can understand like nice and straightforward. It's not too technical or, or like weird. Um, and like D&D &D doesn't have mechanical GM aids as much as some other games do, right? Like, it doesn't have a system like a Fronts in an Apocalypse world or, like, the GM turn in Stars Without Number. It doesn't have something like that. But this is, this is like, in that direction, which is good because I think one of the big frustrations, one of the reasons people feel like there's no GMs to run games is because 5e feels like a headache to run. So having... A streamlined bullet list like this helps a lot. Um, yeah, seriously. Granted, I only usually prep for like an hour or two at most. But hey, you know, you have those days. Where <laughs> I you wish. Have those, I you have those fucking weeks where wish you go my extra. prep right now is like, nah, dog. My prep right now is like four hours plus a week. Uh, well, that's a little excessive. Uh, yeah, well, because I got to do the care. Like, I don't got it, but I do the character dossiers. I got to prep the fucking. The <laughs> you immediately go. I, I don't got it. I no, I don't, but I do. Um, you know, got to prep the maps, uh, the sit reps. I got to figure out balancing. Yeah, it's it's, it's like six to eight hours of prep a week. I have a feeling you probably could tighten that up a bit, but. That's not the yeah. Which be don't do character dossiers. That would that would that be would help the actual way to do it. Which that I mean, uh, no, I've I've stuck to this bit. I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> I see, I see. Um, then it talks about how to run a session. Talks about doing a recap, um, handling encounters, 
Step two, let the players talk. Once you're done describing the situation, ask the players what their characters want to do. Note that players say and identify how to resolve their actions. Ask them for information if you need it. I don't know why that one I thought was funny or it specifically is like, let them talk. Let them do the thing, <laughs> please. Um, uh, yes. I, this is, so this is one of the funniest things that I that I've noticed that happened in my game is I try to figure out how to get my players to I have, to, I have to figure out how to get my players to do things as a group. Yes. Because what, what I get a lot of is out of mission, players will just go off and do their own thing. And then yes. I have 15 to 20 minute conversations with just that player and everyone else is, is quiet because they're not there. And I've been trying to tighten it up and so far have not been successful. This is not my player's fault. This is me like not organizing things in such a way that it's conducive to them going out as a party. Uh, I haven't figured out the sweet spot for that one. Still, uh, I think it just has to be a case of years. it's a case of making the stuff that they are doing something that is relevant to everyone or at least a, a couple of them. Mm. Right. Like, oh, I'm going to go talk to, you know, my captain or whatever. And then another player goes, oh, well, I need to talk to the captain, too, for a different reason. So let's both go, you know, like that kind of a thing. Fair enough. Incentivize so that they have to kind of cooperate like it's the it's the um, it's the apocalypse world calls it um, NPC triangles where you have a PC at the top and then two NPCs at the bottom and then the two NPCs are linked at the bottom. So it mm-hmm. makes a triangle. Uh, but you can also do it where it's two PCs at the bottom and an NPC at the top. But the idea is that they're linked in a three way so that no matter what you do to one of them affects the other two. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Try that. Yeah. So it's like, for example, if you had one player was like, uh, oh, I need to go talk to the captain. And then another player was like, oh, uh, I need to go talk to my brother. Then you make the captain, both the captain and that person's brother, make them both as the same Mm -hmm. NPC, because then the players are now linked in a triangle with that NPC. That's why I ad- so simple and yet <laughs> well, that's why I advocate. I, I always say like adding more NPCs is often not necessarily like maybe I shouldn't say often, but adding more NPCs is not always the move. A lot of the time reusing an NPC for an for another purpose can be really beneficial because then they get tied to multiple characters and then multiple people are invested or it can be as simple as just the players as a group are getting invested because they keep seeing that NPC over and over again, right? If you have your Gilmore who sells you magic items and then the player characters go to talk to the king and the king is like, oh yes, this, uh, let me bring my magical advisor and don't make a new NPC, make Gilmore the magic advisor to the king. Because the players already know him, now they're invested, they see him again, they get a little more invested, right? You get what I'm saying? Hmm. Yeah, re, 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 NPC reuse is a big deal. Mucho, buen, mucho bueno. Yes, I'm gonna. I mean, I'm gonna have to figure out how to balance that because I love making NPCs. I have a million of them because I like making. Them. <laughs> so. Yes, I mean, yeah, I think you just have to like cut yourself off at some point. Mm. Look, look at you know, look where an NPC can be reused. Like, look where it would make sense for them to be both this thing and that thing, whatever that might be. Uh, hmm. anyway, uh, yeah, so you get after let the players talk, you know, describe what happens, blah, blah, blah. End of session. It gives a little example of play talks about the passing of time, you know, when, when it basically, when do you need to track a little more specifically? And when you don't, it's kind of a quick little, it's like two paragraphs, but still, this is all still the basics, right? Uh, it talks a little bit about, uh, play style. For a GM, do you want to do hack and slash, all ages or mature themes, gritty or cinematic, serious or silly? Um, interesting little bit to put in there. Not necessarily something I would have personally thought was important to go in there, but not necessarily bad either. I, I don't know. Actually, I, I think it is very important. You know, like if that was something that we were aware of when I had started 
I'm sure the campaign that I was in at the time would have had a very different outcome. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, if it was described what the tone, what the vibe was going to be, what the play style was going to be. Yes. And if not only if it was described, but if if, the you know, my GM had the wherewithal, had the information at hand to like think about that as something that was like, you know, we're thinking about taking time. Yeah. We're not even worth thinking about, like, worth really discussing with the players on. Because, you know, as I said it before, when we had started that, when we were originally pitched that campaign, we didn't really have any information on it until, like, our characters were made. And then we were told after the fact that it was going to be, like, more gritty and realistic. And then we were, you know, quite unprepared for how gritty and grimdark it actually was. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, a, you know, you sign on to play the Avengers you find out that it's the Dark Knight Rises and then, oh, uh, jokes on you. Actually, it's the boys, you know, <laughs> <laughs> jokes on you. It's the boys. Oh, my. Um, it wasn't that like that's a uh, potentially an, an unfair comparison, but that, that, that is the like. I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, it mentions uh, it does specifically call out. And I think this is funny. This feels like something that's in here specifically because we live in, you know, the age of the Internet. Uh, one of the best ways to learn how to, because it talks about, uh, you know, learning how to play the game. One of the best ways to learn how to run a D&D game is to observe other DMs in action. Another DM could give you a solid foundation of understanding the role as well as inspire you to write cool things. You could use these questions to help you reflect on a game you observe. Beginning a session, how'd they start? Body language. Uh, what gestures did they do use? DM voice, player participation, rules adjudication, the three pillars, tone and mood, turns of phrase, world building. This feels like a, so you watched Critical Role. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, It's a yeah. little bit what that section feels like, which I thought was funny. Oh, yeah, they also have these tracking sheets um, throughout this DMG. I don't know that I would ever use them, but they're interesting. Um, what are they? So they're basically fancy note taking sheets. So like there's one right here after after that bit I just described, there's game expectations and then it has like DM name, player name and it has little subheaders, game theme and flavor, potentially sensitive elements, hard limit X card, soft limit handle with care or off camera players, hopes and expectations at the table concerns. They're like note tracking sheets. Um, there's another one. Let me see if I can find. They're actually in the table of context. Contents. Contents. Not content. Uh, game expectations. Travel planner. NPC tracker. Settlement tracker. Campaign journal. DM's character tracker. Campaign conflicts. Magic item tracker. And bastion tracker are the various tracking sheets. Hmm. They're fancy note sheets. They don't have any particular mechanical thing per se but yeah uh then it has a a page uh i think a uh no one two three basically three pages under the header ensuring fun for all (laughs) um (laughs) mutual respect setting expectations hard and soft limits uh respect for the players tragic limits just kind of a funny one tragic just, limits oh please do tell what is that about uh some players resist getting invested in the world of the game because they don't want to endure the pain of seeing the people and places they care about threatened or destroyed other players uh, this is me this is uh, i am other players gleefully <laughs> gleefully detail a backstory full of beloved npcs fully expecting the dm to use them use those peoples as bait tragic victims and unexpected villains <laughs> it's me i'm the second one it's important to understand oh, your enough. player's preferences uh, so you neither alienate the players by callously destroying what they love, nor bore them by leaving their backstory out of the campaign story. Uh, when you have an antagonist... You know who that sounds like? The, the, huh? the second one? That sounds like Moon. That sounds like Moon as a player. Oh. Because me and her every campaign which is to say all two of them, it's like, oh, here's all these character backstories. Alright, and time to dump some trauma, baby! <laughs> <laughs> Destroy them. Destroy my life. Fuck me up, fam. I have brought Moon to tears several times, consensually, of course. Like, but <laughs> consensually. Um, yep. when you have an antagonist threaten the player, the people and places the player characters love, be sure the characters have a chance to stave off the worst outcome during the game. Characters should have the opportunity to avoid or mitigate losses 
in heroic ways, with tragedy being a consequence of the character's actions and decisions, not a foregone conclusion. Moments of helplessness in the face of devastating tragedy are better suited for character backstories. Uh, it mentions DM die rolling, and it says you it, visible die rolling. It offers like, yeah, just roll out in the open if you want. That's that feels sacrilegious to me, but you know, you do you, I guess. I mean, you're you you've stated several times that you're a roll behind the screen kind of guy. Yes, I am. I need that. I need that little bit of an air of mystery. Um, it talks Even though about, you will never fudge rolls or do anything. Like I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it talks about dealing with those overly cautious pl- uh, b- players that are like checking every tile and every door, which I thought was funny. Um, talks about dealing with character knowledge versus player knowledge, rules, arguments, player rolling where like if they should, you know, play basically says players should always roll in the out in the open. Don't let them cheat. You know, hmm. uh, also when a die falls on the floor, do you count it or re-roll it when it lands cocked against a book? Do you pull the book away and see where it lands or re-roll the die? Work the players to answer these questions. Cock die always gets re-rolled. Come on, people. Yeah, yeah. Cock uh, die gets re-rolled. It, it mentions antisocial behavior. <laughs> People often play d d because it lets them, through their characters, do things they can't do in real life, fight monsters, cast spells, so on. However, some players, for some players, this means wreaking havoc on towns or betraying their allies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> I kind of love that, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, they're just, they, there's a lot of calling out people doing that kind of bullshit. This one I like a lot. So players exploiting the rules. Some players enjoy pouring over D&D rules and looking for optimal combinations. This uh, this kind of optimizing is part of the game, but it can cross a line into being exploitative, interfering with everyone else's fun. Setting clear expectations is essential when dealing with this kind of rules exploitations. Exploitations. Bear these principles in mind. The top one. Rules aren't physics. <laughs> I know I showed you this picture, but I'm going to read this one verbatim. The rules of the game are meant to provide a fun game experience, not to describe the laws of physics in the world of D&D, let alone the real world. Don't let players argue that a bucket brigade of ordinary people can accelerate a spear to light speed all by using a ready action to pass the spear to the next person in line. The ready action facilitates (laughs) heroic action. It doesn't define the physical limitations of what can happen in a six second <laughs> combat round. <laughs> I disagree. The peasant railgun is awesome <laughs> and I should be allowed to use it to one shot the ancient red dragon. <laughs> Fuck you, wizards. There is no scenario where I'm ever letting anyone use a fucking peasant railgun. I happening. love the peasant railgun so much. Uh, it I, also- dude, that's one of those things where you're like, you forget that they that you know the people who write these books are also on the internet. On the internet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're, you're like, how dare they call out they the called, peasant rail gun? They called it out hard. <laughs> they really did. Uh, they also uh, the game is not an economy. I like that one. Combat is for the enemies. Um, and then rules rely on a good faith interpretation. The rules assume that everyone reading and interpreting the rules has interests of the group's fun at heart and is reading the rules in that light. In other words, stop being that dickhead who's trying to optimize by reading the rules in a very specific way because they used a certain kind of word. Stop being that guy. Nobody likes it. Stop it. Uh, and then a tiny little section talking about using a virtual tabletop, which... Oh, that they've been to... Uh, yeah. Um... Hmm. What? I just... I, it's interesting that they, like... I wouldn't expect them to talk about the virtual tabletop, but now they're have they're going to have their own soon, so... I mean, I, it I, is yeah, no, literally... It make I mean, sense. it's so tiny, I could read the whole thing. Setting expectations is just as, per, per, as important in a digital environment as in person. Some groups can find out-of-character jokes, comments, and memes to... I don't like that they use the word memes in the D&D book... <laughs> <laughs> and memes to a text channel keeping the voice channel focused on the game but some groups find it distracting to have separate conversations unfolding in text while the game is going on choose an option that works best for your group who moves tokens on the virtual tabletop are players expected to use the built-in dice roller is it okay to roll physical dice and report the result uh, the particular technology you're using might dictate answers to these questions or raise other questions you'll need to sort out as you play 
That's the whole section. That's it. So they mentioned it very briefly. Fair enough. I, I had figured it was like a they were actually going to talk about the VTT. No, that they were going to that they're you know developing. I, I thought I think, that's what the hmm was. No, I, I think they don't want to talk about the VTT specifically because then it takes away. It makes the book slightly less evergreen, right? Because if you mention the VTT and then five years down the road, the VTT implodes and nobody uses it, then it's kind of weird if it's in the DMG f- for the rest of time. You know what I mean? True enough. Yeah. Uh, then t- then you get chapter two, running the game. Know your players. Um, it talks about players who like acting, exploring, fighting, instigating. <laughs> like instigating. Uh, optimizing. These are all sections. I'm just not reading them, obviously. Optimizing, problem solving, socializing, storytelling. You know. Uh, you're different kinds of players. We've all heard that kit and caboodle. Uh, group size. They, they didn't reference my favorite kind of my, me as a player, uh, the problem solver. <laughs> I think that's the optimizer. I suppose so. I just feel like problem solver does not quite. Ig- and or ig- instigator. Ig- oh, no, that's, problem yeah, solver. Oh, no, there's one called problem solver. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's me. Never mind. Operation okay. Rocket Man. Yes. Um, it mentions group size. Nothing super crazy here. I will say something that I think is interesting when it mentions group size. Uh, it mentions using a DMPC. They call it a DM controlled oh. adventurer. And it says you can make an adventurer character of your own in parentheses, sometimes called a DMPC, a, a dungeon master oh, that, player mm. to accompany mm. the party. Uh, this is a rewarding way for you to role play with your friends, but while they're exploring your world, but keep in mind that you'll have to run this NPC in combat. Be sure to keep the player characters in the spotlight and don't take away the player's agency by having your character make decisions for the group. So they mentioned basically it's a, the cor- it's a slippery the cor- slope they're walking on. <laughs> it is, but they describe it like how to utilize it correctly, you know? Yeah, yeah, because there is a, a correct way to do it for sure. Uh, nothing crazy there. They talk about dealing with absent players after that. What to do with them? Oh, please. I actually super interested in that one. Um, I mean, so fading into the background, having the character simply fade into the background. This requires everyone to step out of the game world a bit and suspend disbelief. Um, narrative contrivance. Decide the character. I, I that wasn't the whole paragraph. I'm not reading the whole paragraph. Decide the character mm. is elsewhere where the rest of the party continues the adventure. Substitute the player with the absent player's consent. Have other players run the missing player character or run the character yourself if you feel you can do so. Uh, Give the absent characters the same XP that everyone else gets each session. Uh, Some groups like to work out a policy regarding how many missing players is too many to proceed. For example, your group might play as long as no more than one person is absent. If two or more people can't attend a session, consider playing a short adventure with different characters or perhaps a different DM or bring out a favorite board game. (laughs) Oh, nothing crazy there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know what I was what I was expecting, but yeah, I mean that's that's about fair. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the first two chapters are like social, like how to handle the social elements and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like absent players is is about like yeah like having that chat and figuring it out. Uh, incorporating new players, they mention. They mentioned multiple DMs in a section, which I was like, oh, okay. Uh, How to narrate, nothing crazy. Resolving outcomes, uh, ability checks and proficiency. They tell you how to do like adjudicate the different ability scores, group checks, passive checks, trying again, saving throws, attack throw, attack rolls. Uh, typical DCs, calculated DCs, managing advantage, disadvantage. Uh, they do mention in the consequences section, I kind of like this. They mention utilizing success at a cost, degrees of success, and degrees of failure. Let's go. They don't codify it super great, but they they mention it. They bring it up. So, you know, at least they're thinking about it. Um, they have the improvised damage tables. <laughs> I just, I, sorry, wait one but. second. I, the way you worded that, 
uh, reminded me. I was watching uh, a podcast today, and Please. one of the one of the people on the podcast was British, and they did the the swings and roundabouts uh-huh. as a saying. And my brain auto corrected to the Randy felt face. Just swings and roundabouts. People just swings and roundabouts. <laughs> It just, I don't know. It made me go, oh, that's, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> what does any of that have to do with what I just said? It's just the way you worded it. It just. Oh. Okay. Shut up. Let me alone. <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> okay. I'm just confused, but okay. Um, It does also mention critical success or failure. Like, you can award extra for a critical success, but mechanically it does say, like, there's nothing hard-coded in the rules about rolling a 20 or a 1. So, you know. Um, I found it really weird that the... So, you know the improvising damage tables from the DMG? You ever seen those? No? Okay, so it's just a little table. Maybe? It's, it's like improvising damage. If the characters are burned by coal, hit by a falling book plate, bookcase, pricked by a poison oh, needle, yes. one, yeah, 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 one yeah, yeah. d10 damage. Struck by lightning, two d10 damage. Hit by falling rubble, four d10. Crushed by compacting walls, ten d10. Submerged in lava, eighteen d10. Uh, tumbling in a vortex of a fire round? on the elemental plane of fire, twenty-four d10. That was a lot of words. <laughs> tumbling in a vortex of fire on the elemental plane of fire. Yeah, that, that that's very firing rifles into the air while balls leaping a squealing hog from a uh, yes uh, cards against humanity. It does have a little bit of that, um, and then they also have a damage severity by level, uh, and then they have new uh, like they so they have nuisance damage and deadly damage, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, nuisance so for, damage, I like that. Yeah, so for characters level one to four, nuisance damage is one d ten, deadly damage is two d ten. For 5 to 10, nuisance damage would be 2d10, and then deadly damage would be 4d10, etc, etc. It's broken up into the four tiers, of course. <laughs> I do find it a little weird that the improvising damage section is... is after the, like, adjudicating rolls and stuff, as opposed to in the section that talks about, like, traps and shit. thought that was kind of weird. Oh, yeah. There is a section... There is a separate table for, like, setting up the traps and the damage and stuff. So I guess that's why. I don't know. I thought that was in a slightly weird place. Um, yeah, I can see what you're saying on there. There is a whole chunk on role playing, running social encounters and running exploration. The running exploration bit. I mean, it, it's actually so it's let's see one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, basically nine pages dedicated to exploration and travel. A couple of those are half pages, so we'll call it seven pages. Uh, so I was pretty happy about that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a solid amount. They talk about how to handle like tracking time, you know, using a map. Tracking your turns, ability checks and exploration, stuff like, you know, perception, obviously. Uh, when to call for a check versus when to use your passive perception. Um, how far away something can hear you. Oh, this was interesting. There's a table. If you're trying to be quiet, then something can hear you 2d6 times 5 feet away. Normal is 2d6 times 10 feet away. And very loud is 2d6 times 50 feet away. But that was oh huh. interesting. That's for auto. 2D, 2D6. What was, for, what was quiet? 2D6 times 5 feet. That's really fucking far. Um, it can. It, yeah, I mean, two, 12 times 5. Yeah, it could be. Could be 60 feet. Yeah. No, that's not 60 feet. If you're what trying is, to be. What is that? 12 times 5. Yeah, that's 60. Did I do that right? Yeah, 60 feet. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That feels. A on the upper weird end, to me, You're like I'm, where I'm trying to whisper, and someone can hear me from sixty feet away. That's it. Doesn't specify like talking per se. It just says audible. So like walking, I guess, could also be part. I don't know. Yeah, it's a little. It's a little vague. Uh, they also talk about visibility underwater, which I thought was funny. Clear water, sixty feet. Clear water, dim light, thirty feet. Murky water, darkness, ten feet. Visibility. 
That was a rant, interesting one. The fun bit, though, is when it gets to uh, travel. And it talks about having journey stages, which is interesting. Um, and basically, set your pace and narrate your travel, track your food and water, and then track your progress through the stages. So it's like... Rather than necessarily hex by hex or whatever, which you obviously could still do, it's like, um, where does it give the example? Uh, decide, okay. You can use the travel planner, uh, for each stage, note where it starts and ends, distant cover, the predominant terrain, choose, uh, choose or roll randomly to determine weather. Where did it say? Oh yeah, for example, characters might travel along a river to a forest edge, stage one. Follow a trail into the heart of the woods, stage two, and then search the woods for an ancient ruin, stage three. So it talks about breaking them up into like bespoke stages as opposed to trying to be like specific with distance or some shit like that, which no one wants to fucking do. Um, <laughs> and then it gives you a weather table, which was actually in the other DMG. But then there's a travel ter travel terrain, and this is a really cool table. So it's. Arctic, coastal, desert, forest, grassland, hill, mountain, swamp, underdark, urban, waterborne. And it says the maximum speed that you can travel through this terrain. It says encounter distances. So like roughly how far something could see you. And then it's got a foraging DC, navigating DC, and a search DC for each of those terrains. Uh, so I thought that was pretty good. That's much more useful than the way it talks about in the old. I forget exactly how it talked about in the old one, but it was not that it was not clear in that fashion. Um, yeah, then, yeah, that's that's actually I kind of want to get this book now. <laughs> we haven't even got to the good stuff. Um, it also then talks about special movement and like miles like. So, for example, if your characters have wind walk or a flying carpet, it tells you how to do the math to break down how fast they can travel with that particular thing. So like miles per hour is speed divided by 10 like a magic carpet I forget how many what its speed is but let's say it's 100 feet right so 100 feet divided by 10 it can fly at 10 miles an hour so nice and that's, then it, and then it tells you how many miles you should a little, be able to do in about a day that gets a little wonky because you've got things like uh what was the uh um there are There's like a bald eagle or something in the monster manual. And you're like, well, those things can fly at like 100 miles an hour or, you know, that are 60 miles an hour or whatever for prolonged periods of time. But based on that, because their speed is only 60, they can only move at six miles an hour. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, game. <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. I, I feel like with that, I, I XP level three had a good version of this where it was like, it was a, a, a move in the action economy called sprint that was like five times your movement. Mm. I feel like there should be a travel speed. That um, maybe you don't have to mark it in like the, the stat block specifically. Well, there are travel. There is a travel speed. Uh, there's a travel pace table in the player's handbook. Oh, is there? OK, cool. Yes. Um, it does also talking about using like if you're on good roads, the presence of a good road increases the increases the group's maximum pace by one step. So from normal to fast, for example, hmm. um, extended movement, vehicles, blah, blah, blah. Journey stage challenges. It bring, talks about uh, and how to deal with like encountering other things on the journey and then foraging, navigating. Basically, it, it breaks down all of the travel stuff. Like pretty much as much as mu I read through this section quite thoroughly and I was quite happy with it. So that's cool. I mean, there's still there's some other bits. I would like some little more n mechanical stuff tacked on. But for the most part, I'm pretty into it. Yeah, I, I like that they're they're getting into what's the word I'm looking for. They're they're getting into like practical granularity, I guess is what I want to call it. Practically, like yeah, they are getting specific and giving you like you see, you, know, you kind of don't understand what I'm talking about, right? Like they are yes. getting specific and kind of noodly is the right word, but like granular. But it's for practical things, things that do come up in game. Well, yeah, it's it's a granularity that's like useful and not going to come up. It's not going to come up all the time to the point where it's a nuisance. It's only going to be once in a while. So it's OK. Yeah, exactly. Practical granularity. Yeah. I, 
I think I named that kind of perfectly. I'm not going <laughs> to <lie. laughs> Um, After the travel stuff, it talks about running combat. I'm pretty sure this section is identical to the old one. It looks basically identical to me. I did not see anything particularly notable in there. So it's running combat. Do the thing. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, how do they, do they talk about, I mean, not that I remember how they did in the old DMG, but do they talk about, like, who goes where and, like, who goes when if, if players, like, tie or if monsters tie with them? Uh, yeah, I mean, the tying rules are simple. If players tie, the players decide. If the monster and the player ties, the GM decides. Oh, the GM decides. Okay, interesting. Yes, rules is written, the GM. Most GMs just let the players get it first but technically the gm decides you know there's a there's a toggleable thing in roll 20 that you can put uh it, it looks like a decimal place yes it's, on, it's your deck score yeah it does no, say it's the deck score i like that i used that for my last campaign and i think it works pretty well i'm fine with it my problem is that dex is already so highly valuable do we need to make another thing that it's useful for <laughs> I mean, yeah, I just sort of think of it as an extension to initiative. It is mostly, yes. Uh, Obviously not dex as a stat, but like uh, using dex in initiative as well as to no, no, yeah, denote yeah. your place at matching you initiative. I know what you mean. Um, does it say not the uh, Yeah. Combat starts when you say blah, blah, blah. Something like that. You, not the players, decide initiative role to high level barbarian kids. Just, uh, in any situation where characters actually initiate combat. Uh, I'm to see if it mentions eyes in here. It, it's it got us somewhere, but yeah, I know that that's the rule. I found that before. Uh, him list. Oh, yeah. Mentions using a hidden lit, uh, like uh, initiative that the players can't see. I don't know about that one, Chief. Not a fan. Well, isn't that. that kind of what you did when the monsters turn invisible? Uh, no, I told you what their initiative was. Wouldn't I? Wouldn't. Or did you remove them from the initiative tracker? Or oh no, if you put them on the GM screen, roll twenty removes the initiative. Oh, okay. So that wasn't a thing you were actively doing. That was no, just roll twenty does that. A side effect of uh, yes, okay. yes. All right, I see. Um, I mean, I don't hate that, especially if you know you give like it'd be really interesting to have, for example, a monster go invisible, and maybe an enemy has the alert feat so they could swap initiatives. Uh, well, you know what I'm saying? That's a well, you can't swap initiative once it's already been rolled at like, that would only be at the uh, very beginning damn it initiative static once it like that, that's the thing about initiative in 5e is like once it's set it's set like I don't think there's I don't think there's anything in the game that can fuck with it once you're going not to my knowledge yeah I mean I I, I wouldn't know either that's fun I, I, that's, I thought I remembered that's how the alert feat works now, but I, yeah, I guess it makes more sense that it's at the start of combat. Yeah, it's only at the start of combat. That is how the alert feat works, but only at the very beginning. Gotcha. Uh, so yeah, combat section. It talks about like you know how you can make combat interesting, changing the terrain, having different monsters, you know, stuff like that. Then it gets to character advancement. So for anyone who's curious if character advancement changed. Uh, uh, like kinda but like no <laughs> so you still get XP based on killing monsters that's the rules as written it does also mention as a GM as a DM rewarding XP for your players overcoming non-combat challenges and it says if they overcome a non-combat challenge award the characters XP as if it had been a combat a combat encounter of the same difficulty Obviously, you're going to have to adjudicate how hard the thing was, which can be tricky. I actually basically did exactly that in our game. Or when I did like quest, what, I think I called it challenge XP. But yeah, I did. I did like exactly that. So, you know, yeah, um, I used to I use challenge XP as well. I, I started doing it with um, obviously they had 
uh, Hellscapes has the environmental encounters. Yeah. Like it's raining acid or meteors or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, same idea. Um, and, and then it mentions also Milestone XP, but not the one where you auto level up. Basically, Milestone XP, as they're describing it, is if you complete like a quest of some kind, then you get XP for it. So it says, uh, if you want to reward your players for progressing through an adventure with something. Oh, no, sorry. Wrong one. Uh, when you award XP, treat a major milestone as a high difficulty encounter and a minor milestone as a low difficulty encounter. So it's basically like if you want them to get like a quest XP or an event XP type thing, treat it as the encounter and then divvy up the XP that way. Those are technically optional rules that they are mentioning, but honestly, I see no reason not to use them ever. <laughs> so, yeah, it will help out. It'll help fill out the XP gap that gets, you know, <laughs> once cool you start being like, well, we have to fight 15 Tarasks to level yeah. up again. Yeah. According to Chris Perkins, those are optional rules. According to me, they are not. Use them, goddammit. According to most people, they are not. And then we have the DM's toolbox, chapter three, which is like arguably my favorite chapter and the one that I cared about the most because um, it has the most mechanics in it. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> it starts off talking about alignment. And I just. I just I, I don't I don't understand why is a I Why is alignment <laughs> like I don't understand at this point they've removed basically anything that alignment dictates in the game at all but it's still in the game it got i don't know if you saw this or not isaiah in the player's handbook they made an alignment chart like one like an alignment square that's like an illustrated piece of cool looking art for the alignment this thing that they don't use <laughs> I did not see that. I kind of love that, though. It's it just feels really weird. I just don't like all of the magic I mean, items I, that had alignment rules on them are gone. Not the magic item, but the alignment rule. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, it's just weird to me. I don't know. I sort of think about it this way, right? I, I, I think alignment still has a place in RPGs, but, but I think it's just have to sh it has to shift its purpose. So like yeah. alignment used to be this hard you know, bespoke thing that if your character was in alignment, that was that like it was more than a uh, a character thing. It was like a law of reality. It was like low key a religion. Yeah. But, but to keep alignment and to be like, this is how you should think about your player. Do they do they think about the world this way, this way, this way, or this way on average? And then, of course, they can, you know, separate from that as an exception. And that's its own thing. Well, it specifically does uh, hold on cat in the way uh it specifically does say actions indicate alignment a character might think they're good and profess to believe that senseless slaughter is wrong but if that character repeatedly engages in senseless senseless slaughter the character's beliefs aren't what they profess alignment doesn't limit the action characters can take rather the actions they take indicate what their alignment is it's okay to extrain from the attendance of one alignment now and then and the players can and should change their character's alignment if these alignments no longer describe their describe their characters. So they talk about it as a malleable thing, but again, the game doesn't use it in any way that it feels like it matters. So it's like, who cares? You know? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, I think they should keep it as just as a character thing, as a way to help new players think about their characters or I don't know that or experienced characters players. to play with just don't know that I it mean, helps I, new players. I don't know. I feel like it typically doesn't help because I think a lot of people incorrectly describe what those alignments actually mean. And and to be fair, this is from like anecdotal experience, but I've had alignments explained to new players, not that I've done this, but I've been like present for conversations where this is described as everything from ah, well, if you're chaotic evil, you're basically the Joker, which is true to a point to, you know, if you're chaotic evil, you're, uh, what was the term? You're an anarchist, which like, yes, those are sort of fundamentally the same thing, but they have different connotations. You know what I mean? 
One is like, I don't believe in laws. And the other one is the Joker. Uh, I mean, I just I don't even think it's that complicated. I just don't think that alignment is useful for new players because I don't think new players come to the game thinking about stuff like that. I think they just think I have an idea of what kind of character my character is like. They don't think about slotting them into any kind of chart, and I don't think slotting them into a chart is going to really help them. They already have an idea of like what their character is from just a personality standpoint. Like, I, I don't I don't think the, um, the like tag of alignment is doing anything really. At least I don't feel like it is. Maybe there's some player out there who thought it was really. I, I mean, I'm sure there's some out there who thought it was useful. I don't know. Um, it does mention that the I mean, outer planes uh, are realms where alignment manifests in reality. When you can explore the outer planes, they can experience those realms differently depending on their alignment. So it's kind of relevant for that. <laughs> yes. I mean, I was going to say, I, I, I don't know. I, I thought the alignment chart really helped me with pause to like keep me grounded and be like lawful evil does not mean I'm a villain. I just care more about me and my shit than the party and the party's shit. No, that is a way to interpret it. Yeah, but some people would argue that's not what lawful evil means either. But that's part of the problem, too, right? Well, I believe the the, the old player's handbook describes evil as you put your interests before the interests of others. You are inherently. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Selfish. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, I don't remember specifically. I think the new new player's handbook does also describe it, it it describes it on that alignment page i don't remember what it says but like i don't know whatever it doesn't i don't it's not even really worth going into because it's such a small thing anyway <laughs> it just feels like i guess to me it just feels like they are keeping a thing around purely for the legacy of it and not because they actually want to keep it around you know what i mean they're paying lip service yeah i mean that's i, I don't think you're entirely wrong there for sure uh, although it does say a creature starting attitude might be affected by their alignment. A hostile, a chaotic evil monster is likely to be hostile, but a lawful good one is more likely to have a friendly attitude. I guess that's the thing. Uh, it also says good. And, it, there's a little section that says good and evil can cooperate. Which I thought was funny. Yeah. I, <laughs> one of those things where you go, I shouldn't have to say this, but... Yeah, I mean, it's not a bit. It's it's one paragraph, but still. Uh, and then organization alignments. OK. So you start with the alignment, right? And this is the DM's toolbox chapter. The next page is chases. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm proud. Interesting to decision. I'm proud to announce. Chases still suck fat balls. It's a massive oof, bud. Yep. Yep. Arguably might be worse. Maybe. How, brother? How uh, is it worse? So you remember the complication tables? Yeah. Wasn't Pre a fan of those. Pretty sure there's less. Oh. I think there's less. Actually, I'm going to look real quick before I talk out my ass. Yeah, they went from a D20 to a D12 worth of complications. And on a 7 to 12, there is no complication. Oh, all right. Well, on the two tables. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, basically, the way it describes and I, I just. I, I just don't understand this. OK, I, I, I need to read this because it I, I read this and I was like. Did no one proofread this? The rules for movement in combat don't translate to every situation. In particular, they make they they can make what? In particular, they can make a potentially thrilling chase seem dull and predictable. Faster creatures always catch up to slower ones, while creatures with the same speed never close the distance between each other. Use the following rules to introduce random elements that make the chase more exciting. Know the capabilities of the characters in your party before you make a chase an important feature. A character with a high speed or the right spell, such as Dimension Door, Fly, or Hold Monster, can often end a chase before it begins. So you would think, based on that wording, 
that they are acknowledging using movement speed like you do in combat doesn't work very well for chasing, right? Yes. Then they just tell you to use movement speed in chases. Hmm. Running the chase. Participants in the chase are strongly motivated to take the dash action every round. Pursuers who stop to cast a spell and make attacks run the risk of losing their quarry, and a quarry that doesn't take the dash action is likely to be caught. Okay, so every round, everyone's just going to dash action. And then everyone's going to move the same distance every round. And the only thing uh, that's going to break it up is going to be a complication or your quarry escaping. Well, I actually, no. So I, I, I think I see what they're saying is that in a chase, you have a designated chaser or number of chasers. But they're also saying... Other players, if you're not actively running after someone, do things out of combat to introduce complications or to stop them. That's why they brought up the spells. Um, So, you know, if you're... Sure, I guess if you're hypothetically not the one chasing after somebody, I guess. But, like, they literally just tell you to run chase like a combat. They say you have one... On your turn, you get an action and a move. It says when a chase begins, hmm. uh, or where is it? Uh, any part- yeah, any participants not already in the initial order must roll initiative as the chase begins. As in combat, each participant in the chase can take one action and a move on its turn. So they're just telling you to run combat as a chase. Yeah, I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, and the only difference is the complications and the quarry, which is the person who's being chased can try to escape. But like, I don't understand, like, and not all of the complications necessarily slow the person down. So it's just going to be for uh, several turns of like, I dash, I dash, I dash, hoping for a complication to slow the person down so you can actually catch up to it. Like if you have a movement speed of 30 feet and they have a movement speed of 30 feet, your only hope is a complication or a spell. And if you have a spell that'll stop them, then there is no chase. You'll just say, I dimension door. And then I grab them. You know, like, so it's yeah. like, what the fuck? So there's no point in running a chase. So, uh, yeah, they still suck. Chase rules still suck. I I was really hoping for something better. And uh, yeah, no. Nope. <laughs> and like, just... Just use, I don't actually don't know if this is, I'm trying to think if this is even any different from the old chase rules. It might not even, it might be identical. I haven't looked at them in a long time. It might be identical. It's like, just, actually, now that I'm looking at the section in the old book, I think it is identical. God damn, dude. What the fuck? Uh, just use blades in the dark. Just use countdown clocks <laughs> to run a chase. That's how you run chases. You use a countdown oh, clock. Oh, I was going to bring that up. Do they bring up clocks at all? In chases? Or in general? No, in general, in the DMG. Not that I've seen. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. After the chase rules, we have creating a background, which works exactly as you would have thought that creating a custom background would work. Choose three abilities, choose a feat, choose a skill, choose two skill proficiencies, choose a tool proficiency, choose your equipment. So if you looked at the player's handbooks, handbook backgrounds and thought, oh, I bet this is how the custom background works. It works exactly as you thought it did. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So it's literally it's literally half a page. It's such a short little section. It works exactly as you would think. So if you were worried why they decided to put the creating a background in the DMG and not just put it in the player's handbook, I do not know. Just put custom. Yeah, just, I, I uh, just put custom backgrounds in the player's handbook like it used to be. I, I don't know why they took that out. That's it's really dumb. I hated that. I, mm, I don't know. I, I could see an argument where they took it out because player like no players were using the actual backgrounds and like, well, I just want to make my own. But that's not when what was happening. I, and 
I don't know. It's not uh, because they've talked. They talked about it in the videos and stuff. They were like, people would just like they've talked about it before. People will just grab, pick whatever background. Like that's not really what was happening. And also, why would you? Why is it a bad thing if players are just using the cus- or just making custom backgrounds? Is that a problem for some reason? You know, like not that it's necessarily a problem. I I think it's like a we made them with like a certain thought and idea, a balance in mind and just being like, fuck it. I want to make my own sort of, I don't think they were balancing backgrounds in that way. Really? I mean, maybe, I but I, I don't think so. It doesn't seem like either way. I, I, in my thought, the, the intention for custom background, at least the way I, I had sort of always imagined it was, uh, you know, oh, there's this thing in my setting that isn't here, and I can't really find a good substitute for it, so I'll just like use these tools with my own. Oh, see, my train of thought on a custom background is I want to take this feat with these ability scores, and none of those options are in the other backgrounds. So I I'm mean, gonna, I'm gonna do a custom one to make sense to make it fit with my character. You no, know, like yeah. Like, I want to be a soldier character, but I don't necessarily want to take the tough feet. I want to take the alert feet because I was like a scout. You know? Yeah. That's how I always thought about it. I mean, the only real difference is, like, the way I thought about it was DM facing, the way you thought about it was player facing. They're pretty similar at the end of the day. Yeah, but players use backgrounds. That's why I think about them players facing standpoint. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Uh, then there's a brief creating a creature section, which is a, a page and a half. It's not horrible, uh, but it's it's short, but it's got some good suggestions. You know, it talks about like, oh, sometimes you just need to reflavor it, right? Like if you have a character who you want to be a bully, just take an ogre stat block and make them medium size and a humanoid. Now you have a bully, right? Um, or a bouncer or something like that, you know, changing languages, changing the creature's senses or proficiencies, playing around with their immunities a little bit, you know, uh, changing their attacks. If you want to make an ice skeleton, make them deal cold damage, for example. And then it gives a couple of traits. I'm hoping there's going to be a more in-depth version of this in the monster manual. The creating the creature stuff, because there was a really in-depth arguably too in-depth version of creating a monster in the old DMG. So I'm hoping there will be, you know, a happy medium of some kind. Yeah, some sort of streamlined, but still... Still useful. <laughs> yeah. um, they, give a bu- they give a big long... They give a decently... A decent amount of traits that you can also slap on the monster, aversion to fire... Uh, battle ready it has advantage on initiative beast whisper com- communicates with beast uh you know discipline of the nine hells when it dies its body disgorges an imp you know so it's got a couple of suggestion traits then it gives you the creating a magic item page it's a page and it gives you very One. little right very little uh it mostly Love just it. It mostly just tells you to take an existing magic item and modify it instead of making a whole new one. That's pretty much that's mostly what it suggests doing. I mean, I don't disagree. I I, have been a proponent of that since day one. I don't disagree with that either. Um, And then also, there's so many magic items in the fucking game. Do you need to make more? Probably not. No, true. You don't. And then I think it's funny that. It is only one page. It's just, I don't know. Literally one page, but I got a better one for you. Creating a spell. Oh, no. I actually wanted rules for this. <laughs> Half a page. God damn it. <laughs> Half a page. And I'm not exaggerating. There's a huge art piece on the top half of the page, the bottom half of the page, creating a spell. That's it. Aldito sierra fucking madre. With one table that says... Uh, <sighs> Spell level, cantrip to level nine. Uh, how much damage should it do if it targets one person? How much damage should it do if it targets multiple targets? That's the whole thing. That's the whole table. That's terrible. 
it's really short, like crazy short. They basically said, don't Dude. make your own spells, bitch. So, uh, I'm not going to lie. That is genuinely one of the few things that I was like really wanting to see from, from, cause you know, I've, I've played a bunch of wizards and nope. I, I watched the critical role back in the day. And Liam's character made a bunch of spells. And to be fair, some of them were just reflavored spells, but like he did like wholesale make a couple. And I was yeah. like, oh, these are neat. I want to see how I can do it. And I've made my own spells as like a player and pitched them to DMs. And, you know, some of them get picked up, some of them don't. But yeah, it's something I think is super neat that I wanted to see more of. So I'll just go fuck myself. I will say in their defense, uh, the 2014 DMG, it was similarly incredibly brief. So... <sighs> yeah. Uh, I would have liked to see a little bit more of that one, but, uh, you know. I, maybe it'll exist in some other capacity somewhere else. I don't know. That would be cool, but probably not. My sadness. Yeah. And the I will say the creating monster thing, though, was way, way denser in the old. So... Yeah, I wonder what that's about. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Might have just been at the end of the day, page space. Might have just been page space. True. And then we got curses and magical contagions. Uh, curses, kind of what you expect. Cursed creatures, cursed items. It does mention narrative curses, um, which are the thing that you kind of hate. The ones that can't be solved with a simple spell. Yes. Despite the spell saying that it can fix those exact problems. It says a creature affected by such a curse should know why they're being punished and be able to learn how to end the curse, like symbolically writing the wrong they committed. How a spell like remove curse affects a curse that's part of your adventure is up to you. The spell might merely suppress the effects of the curse for a time. Regardless, the narrative curses should feel like a rare, potent magic rooted in the lore of your campaign. So it's not telling you to use them all the time, but yeah. Uh, and then it gives an example of an environmental curse that is demonic possession. Okay, that's kind of neat, though. What, what does that say? Demonic possession arises from the chaos and evil of the abyss commonly uh, and commonly besets creatures with uh, that interact with demonic objects or linger in desecrated locations where demonic spirits await. A creature that becomes the target of a demonic possession must succeed on a DC 15 charisma saving throw or be possessed by a bodiless demonic entity. Whenever the possessed creature rolls a one on a D20 test, the demonic entity take controls of the creature takes control of the creature and determines that creature's behavior thereafter. At the end of each of the possessed creatures later turns, they make a DC 15 charisma saving throw, regaining control of itself on a success. After finishing a long rest, a creature with demonic possession makes a DC 15 charisma saving throw. On a successful save, the effect ends on the creature. A dispel good or evil spell or any magic that removes a curse also ends the effect on it. No. Demonic possession. Basically, you get forced to do some bad things. The GM tells you to stab your friends or whatever. Hmm. Um... And then magical contagions. Uh, this is sort of the repl this appears to be the replacement for diseases. Um, but these well, ones, so this this seems more akin to the thing that I hate the the fucking the sickness that can't be solved with you know. Uh, it doesn't say any of them can't be solved. In fact, it gives you a way to cure each of them. It gave three examples. Oh, okay. Uh, so there's cackle fever. Uh, at the end of each long rest, an infected creature makes a DC 13 con save. After the creature succeeds on three of these saves, the contagion ends on it, and the creature is immune to cackle fever for one year. Uh, for sewer plague, daily at dawn... Oh, these are actually just the diseases. Hold on. Maybe. Daily at dawn, an infected... Oh, no, because cackle fever was. Okay. Uh, daily at dawn, an infected creature makes a DC 11 con save. On a failed save, the creature gains one exhaustion level as its fatigue worsens. On a successful save, the creature... Re uh, the creature's exhaustion level decreases by one. If the creature's exhaustion level is reduced to zero, the contagion ends. And then you have Sight Rot. Uh, magic such as a heal or lesser resto spell ends the contagion immediately. A character who is proficient with an herbalism kit can create a dose of non-magical ointment, which takes an hour when applied to the creature suffering from Sight Rot. 
The ointment suppresses the contagion on the creature for 24 hours. If the contagion is suppressed in this way for a total of 72 hours, requiring three doses, the contagion ends on the creature. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't remember looking at the... Oh, they are the same diseases. I don't know if they're cured the same way or not. Maybe they are. Oh, weird. So then why did they rename them? I'm trying to figure that out myself. Interesting. Okay. I thought these were new and different. Okay. Let's... I've been lied to. I lied to myself, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> huh. Weird. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they're the same ones. Yeah, sight rot. They have the same cure and everything? Uh, oh, they're they didn't worded... Have cures a... back in the day. Okay, so they're worded a little differently. Victim is blinded by magic lesser rest on here. Yeah. All right, so they've been adjusted, but not much. And then you got like a page and a half on death. Ooh. Uh, which is basically like scale, you know, uh, talks about, you know, death must be fair. Don't cheat for the monsters. Don't make it personal. Provide fair warning, fair encounters, scaling the lethality. Uh, if you don't want to kill the players, do you know, you could make them comatose instead. And that gives you an optional rule for how to deal with like a comatose since, as opposed to a character dying. Um, how to handle death scenes and then it says what if everyone dies and it talks about a tpk and it gives you a couple of suggestions such as a fresh start everyone makes new characters a divine council the players find themselves before in a council of deities who are arguing about their fate an escape from the underworld quest in prison they wake up in cells kept alive raised by another you know they're resurrected a thousand years later by a resurrection spell from some dude uh, a rescue mission, create new temporary characters who have to go retrieve the old characters. So it just tells you how to handle like, oh no, I've TPK'd my party unintentionally. What do? I kind of love the uh, arguing at the Castle of Gods. Yeah, the Divine Council. It's a pretty good one. Yeah, that's, I, I, I feel like that should be utilized more. Or, or that or the... um. Cause I or the, the like wake up in prison because I just think of the opening disguise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you're awake. Uh, then after death, we get an entire page on doors. No, no fucking <laughs> way, dude! S swear to God. Glass doors, metal doors, stone doors, wooden doors. You got AC, HP, and DC to open. You got lock complexity, lock quality with DCs, secret doors, the DCs to detect the secret doors, and portcullises, their DC, and how big they are, and how to open them. I a whole page love on doors. That. Oh, and also a little paragraph that says secret door etiquette. I love that so fucking much. Adventurers dude. often fail to locate secret doors. For this reason, don't hide important treasure or locations behind secret doors unless you're comfortable with the characters not finding them. And don't risk letting your adventure grind to a halt because the only path forward is hidden behind a secret door. Yep. Yeah. Whole page on doors. Nice. Uh, and then the next page is dungeon stuff, mapping a dungeon and, you know, deciding, you know, the state of the dungeon. Dunge there's a D100 table for dungeon quirks. Uh, there's another table, the D6 table for the state of ruin of the dungeon. So, like, how fucked up the dungeon is. Talks about, like, natural features and wear and tear and symmetry, three-dimensional layout, multiple pathways and exits and decorations and different rooms that would make sense to have it and yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's like a page and a half. It's, no, it's like two pages worth on the dungeons. And then you have environmental effects. Dead magic zone, deep water, extreme cold, extreme heat, frigid water, heavy precipitation, high altitude, planar effects, and then a list of all the effects based on the plane you're on. Slippery ice, strong wind, thin ice, and wild magic zone. The only thing I'm a little sad about with the environmental effects is I would have liked the, like, magical zones from Tasha's to maybe get reprinted or changed in some, or more. Oh, I'd just love give, that. Just give me more of them. I would like more. Yeah, no, I would love that so much. I, I mean, I talked about how much I love those already. Those are cool, yeah. And then fear and mental stress. It's stupid. Don't even bother. Oh, it's just 
Oh no, make a save. Oh, you have the frightened condition. And then the other one is, oh no, make a save. Oh, you took some psychic damage. It... Oh. And then there's some long-term effects if you want to do those. Such as uh character has disadvantage on ability checks for 1d10 times 10 hours. Yeah, it's a page. Nope. It's boring. They removed the like honor, the honor and sanity and all that crap, but those sucked anyway. So n n nothing lost. They yeah, yeah, that's true. They did kind of suck ass. They sucked. So it's whatever. Uh, the page after that is the firearms and explosives. This is for your modern firearms, you know, your automatic rifles and revolvers and hunting rifles and your alien laser oh. guns. <laughs> I'm funny. I, I'd assume that since those are just in the fucking player's handbook, they wouldn't even be in the DMG. Well, so the player's handbook only has the 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 Renaissance weapons. This has the modern and futuristic weapons. Oh, so antimatter, you know, so the automatic rifle, hunting rifle, revolver, semi-auto pistol, shotgun, and then the antimatter rifle, laser pistol and laser rifle. Um, I don't think this chapter has changed at all. Pretty sure it's the same. Uh, there is a sick piece of art, however, of a dwarf blasting a troll in the chest with a pump action shotgun. Pretty fun. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and the dwarf is holding the shotgun incorrectly. And the caption says, when faced with a troll, there's no time to figure out the right way to hold a shotgun. Please, do you tell me you have a screenshot of this? I got to see this. A screenshot? I mean, no, but I can take a picture of it really quick. Damn it. I mean, yes, please. Uh, it's, it's probably going to look like shit because I can't. Okay, you're going to have to remind me after because I'm going to have to take a not terrible. <laughs> As a newly minted Texan, I have to I have to judge. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> this dwarf's trigger discipline and etiquette. I mean, he's definitely holding it wrong. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, and then you have the gods and other powers. And this is a big, giant several pages that I kind of didn't really or it's two I, it's two pages uh, I didn't really look at it <laughs> fair enough it just talks about I, I, I mean it talks about how to handle the gods and like divine intervention and divine knowledge and what kind of shit to do with them you know the next mm. chapter however hazards I like this one hazards is fun uh, you said that very funny Hazard. <laughs> hazards hazards Got brown mold and green slime and fireball fungus and inferno, which I guess just means like everything's on fire. Uh, do you remember when we almost uh, fucking accidentally ended the Strahd campaign by letting the, the brown mold in the winery out? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then this Dimes. also has the so not for all of them, but quite a few of the hazards have. uh, So like for the brown mold, it says deadly hazard for level 5 to 10 players and then a nuisance hazard for level 11 to 16 players so some of them like you can use later but it won't be as deadly as it was at lower levels which I thought was cool I wish there was yeah. a bit more of that only not as many of them have it as I would like but it's still pretty good uh, oh yeah they give you uh, the river sticks jumping into the river sticks has its own hazard entry and what happens if you do that I Interesting. I mean, there's only one. There's only one outcome. You lose all your memories. Uh, not necessarily. Oh. Uh, the river sticks. Uh, of course, through tasting or touching its waters can shatter a creature's intellect and personality as well as strip away its memories. Certain fiends are immune. Unless immune to the river sticks, a creature that drinks from the sticks enters the river or starts its turn in the river makes a DC 20 intelligence save. On a failed save. The creature takes 3d12 psychic damage and can't cast spells or take the magic action for 30 days. An God affected damn. creature can drink from the sticks and swim in its water without suffering any additional effects. Uh, the effect can be only be ended by greater resto, heal, or wish spell. Or the wish spell. Uh, whatever, I read that wrong. But if the effect... <laughs> If the effect isn't ended after 30 days, the effect becomes permanent and the creature loses all of its memories. At that point, nothing short of a wish spell or divine intervention can undo the effect. Water taken from the sticks loses its potencies after 24 hours, becoming a harmless, foul-tasting liquid. Arcanalos, night hags, and other fell creatures might know rituals that can prolong the water's potency at your discretion. 
At least oh, they yeah. give you monsters that can help. Yeah. Uh, Rockside, Vicious Vine, Yellow Mold, Webs, you know, fun little hazards. Fun stuff yeah. to use to break up the monotony, for sure. They kept the Marks of Prestige section. I, I'm not entirely sure what that section did. Um, If you know you do a job for a noble and they give you a parcel of land or a title or a special medallion or oh, something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Um, it's It looks to be pretty much the same. I didn't notice anything particularly notable about it. The mob it's rules. Fair. I mean, I, I don't. I feel like it, that didn't really changing. No, it didn't. It was. It was fine. The mobs rules. Mob rules. Whatever. They still suck. Yeah. Moving on. All right. Yeah. I, I, there's. I. There's a big fucking table. You add all the monsters together. You do a bit, a little bit of math. You look at the table. It tells you roughly how many monsters should hit if they're attacking or roughly how many should make the save if you're saving against something. You still have to track all of the monsters health individually. So, yeah. No. Why? Why they don't just make a more, a slightly more complex version of the swarm rules, I do not understand. You have you have the solution to this problem already. Just make swarm monsters and just give us a little bit more of the swarm rules. Just add some some mechanics to that and you're good. Just I mean shit. I, bring back minions. You could do that too, but that still has the pro Here's the thing. If I'm doing a swarm or a mob or something, I don't want to track the HP of every creature in the mob. I want it to work like Fantasy Flight Star Wars, where the whole mob has an HP pool, and as the HP pool ticks down, the mob changes. You know, they get weaker as the HP goes down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I don't know. I just feel like actually removing the, the pieces from the board of ink off a minion just feels better. I mean, I guess visually a little bit, sure. But like for me as a GM, it's more of a pain in the ass to track. Yeah. I'd rather. Yeah. That's why I like the swarm creatures in D&D, D &D, the couple that there are, because it's like, oh, at half health, they do less damage. That's fun. Like you're actually doing something. You know what I mean? That's why I want the swarm. Yeah. I want the swarm rules, but just add to them. But this mob, this, this mob table, I know you can't see it, but this table is ugly. Like, and when I say ugly, it's a table. When I say ugly, I mean like hard to read. And I had to read the example like two or three times to understand how the fuck the bath was actually working out. See? Yeah. So that's that. Uh, then you get Copy. some NPC building stuff. I will say they have some names in here. Uh, I thought it was kind of fun. So instead of just doing like orc name, elf name, gnome name, you have common names, Guttural names, lyrical names, monosyllabic names, sinister names, whimsical names. That's the last one. Whimsical names. So. They kind of broke it up in like a, you know, what's the vibes? There's also uh, a fun art piece of a mind flayer whispering sweet nothings into a fire giant's ear. It's kind of funny. Like the, the mind flayer is worm tongue to the fire giant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> I like that. And then we got some NPC personality stuff with the NPC tracker sheet. Nothing particularly exciting. Reoccurring NPCs, NPCs as party members. <laughs> it gives you like there's like a list of like types of NPCs you might create. And one of them, it, uh, one of them is the curmudgeon. Another one is the milk toast healer. Or the walking textbook. Kind of rude. Fair enough. I really like the milk toast healer. That's that's good. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, the NPC healer whose personality matters less than the healer's devotion to the party and ability to cast cure wounds or revivify when needed. Nice. They're aware. <laughs> yep. Uh, they do have a little bit of a like mini mechanic about tracking loyalty score. I don't personally see myself ever using that. But, you know, maybe you're doing like a pirate campaign, maybe. 
I was going to say, it's for people who really want to do the Baldur's Gate. That's exactly what that says to me. Yeah, it's like tracking loyalty and then uh, meaning of the loyalty score and like mutiny and stuff like that. I don't know. Oh, this is a fun one. Poisons. We got a big list of poisons. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen poisons. All with prices, individual prices. Individual. Um, And then there's also four types. uh, Contact, ingested, inhaled, or injury-based poisons. And it tells you that you can harvest poisons from monsters. See, was this so hard? I don't think so. I mean, it's only a paragraph. It's very brief, and it doesn't tell you. It just says... Uh, you take effort for 1d6 minutes, and then you make a DC 20 nature check using a poisoner's kit. On a successful check, the creature harvests enough poison for a single dose, and no additional poison can be harvested from that creature. On a failed check, the character is unable to extract any poison. If the character fails the check by five or more, the character is subjected to the creature's poison. So it tells you you can do it. <laughs> I love the idea of poisoning yourself with yeah. hydrophenone because yeah. <laughs> you weren't careful. So, like, it tells you you could do it, but then doesn't tell you which one of the poisons could come from what creature. So you're going to have to decide that part on your own. Uh, But, yeah. That's a little annoying, but. But it's still cool. I like that there's a lot of poisons. I like that they, you know, they do different stuff and they have prices and shit. That's fun. And that they're it, you're, they're like you use them in different ways, you know, contact versus ingested or whatever. Yeah. They brought back the renown thing. Okay. I guess. <laughs> I, I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> it's in there. It, it is in fact in there. Yeah. It's in there. Um, there's some tel- there's some settlement tables, defining trait, how much can the settlement afford, claim to fame, current calamities, some shops, tavern. Mostly just random tables for the settlement. Which is fine, I guess. Uh, we got a bunch of stats on siege equipment. That was cool. Ballista, cannon, flamethrower coach, keg launcher, lightning cannon, man... Manganel? 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 I don't know. Manganel? I don't know. Ram, siege tower, suspended cauldron, and a trebuchet. I actually like this oh, siege. A manganel is a... It's like a... It's a tiny trebuchet. Just a ah. smaller ale. Got it. I, didn't I like know that. I like having stat blocks for the siege equipment. That's fun. They have AC and hit points and everything. You know. I actually, so I like that because it, it's very evocative of fire of the old Fire Emblem games because you could set those up on the map, and typically they're used against you. But if you can commandeer them by attacking their user, you get. To... Well, that's fun. Not a bad idea. And they hit like a fucking truck. I I mean yes, there's siege equipment. <laughs> it was great because like if you had a they they actually went off the the character stats. So if you had a sniper, you would have a special skill called like all snipers have something called the special skill called sure shot, which is like a ten percent chance to hit no matter what the to hit percent chance is. And ballistas are super inaccurate, but if you there are skills that can are there bill there's items you can give your character that can buff their innate skill. So there's like a sniper you can get with like a 45% chance to sure shot on a ballista. And you're just like one shotting the enemy boss from across the map. Let's see. Uh, it's fine. I'll the, just go fuck myself. I, I mean, I don't know what you want me Like, okay, cool. Like, I, I, I didn't play Fire Emblem. What do you want me to say? I don't know what you want for me. It's fine. I'll just uh, go fuck myself. Okay, you do that. Uh, supernatural gifts and charms. I think this is pretty much the same as the old DMG. I don't think there's anything fancy here. I mean, they're still they're still fun, but I don't think they've changed. The trap rules. I'm pretty sure these are the trap rules in Xanathar's Guide reprinted in here, which is good because those are actually pretty useful, and I did use them in in my campaign quite a few times. So I'm happy about that. Uh. No, no, you know, like, uh-huh. I also use them in my hellscape game. The Xanathar's I rules? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure it's the same rules. 
Uh, that's the end of the DM's toolbox. Then you have creating adventures, which like obviously is going to be a very dense chapter with lots of shit. Uh, you know, they talk about the tiers of play. They give you a bunch of they give you a bunch of uh, random tables for adventure situations, which is fun. I like that. One thing I think is really fun. Uh, there's a key. There's like a legend key on one of the pages for common map symbols. And it shows you all of the different symbols that Wizards uses to draw their like official dungeon maps. And it's like, this symbol's a door. This is an open doorway. This is a pit. This is a stairwell. This is a well. This is a statue. This is a trap. And like it shows you how they distinct like identify all those. I do kind of love that. Yeah, I thought that was fun. I don't know how many people are actually going to use it, but it's fun that they exist. Um, adventure hooks, you know, drawing in your players, patron, supernatural hooks, happenstance, uh, how to plan out encounters, um, and different kinds. It does talk about, it does give you a couple of different objectives. Uh, make peace, protect an NPC or an object, retrieve, and these all have their own little paragraph. Retrieve an object, run a gauntlet, sneak in, stop a ritual, take out a single target, so it does, it gives you some suggestions on how to do, you know, not just kill everyone in the room type fights. There's also a really, really sick art piece of a bunch of goblins about to ambush the shit out of some, out of some adventurers. The goblins are just looking up dope. <laughs> the only uh, thing they can make it better is if they were kobolds. Correct, yes. Then we have the combat encounters section. Uh, like the actual how to build it. So two things I want to point out here. For the most part, most of it's what you would expect. They changed the difficulty a little bit. So remember how there were four? There was, uh, what was it? Easy, medium, hard, deadly, right? Yes. Yeah. Now there's low, moderate, high difficulty. That's it. There's three. Uh, and it says... So this is the phrasing they use for the 2024 difficulty of encounters. Obviously, I have a feeling that this is referring to 2024 monsters, which we don't have yet. So these are probably not going to pan out quite yet. But what it says is an encounter of low difficulty is likely to have one or two scary moments for the players, but their character should emerge victorious with no casualties. One or more of them might need to use a healing resource, however. As a rough guideline, a single monster generally represents a low difficulty challenge for a party of four characters whose level equals the monster's CR. In other words, four level one characters could fight one level four monster. That is actually basically already how I ran the game. So, good to know I was correct. <laughs> <laughs> Moderate difficulty, it says, absent a healer or other resources, an encounter of moderate difficulty could go badly for the adventurer. Weaker characters might get taken out of the fight, and then there's a slim chance one or more characters might die. It specifically calls out absent a heal absent healing. And then a high difficulty encounter could be a lethal one for one or more characters. To survive it, the characters will need smart tactics, quick thinking, and maybe even a little luck. So high difficulty is lethal. Moderate difficulty is you're going to get fucked up. The only thing is when they say lethal, do they mean dead, dead or down? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, they, they say dead. They say lethal. Yeah. A high difficulty encounter could be lethal for one or more characters to survive it. The characters will need smart tactics, quick thinking, and maybe even a little luck. I don't know. They, they, they went from three to four, and then it seems like they adjusted how they think they should go. So I thought that was interesting. And then also the XP budget system is significantly easier. Significantly easier. How so? Every creature has a XP value in its stat block. When you add a creature to your combat encounter, deduct its XP from your bu XP budget to determine how much XP you have left to spend. Spend as much of your XP as you can without going over. It's okay if you have a few unspent left XP left over. 
and the way you determine your budget. I should have read that first, but I should have read this one first, but whatever. Using XP budget per uh, using the XP budget per character table, cross reference the party's level with the desired encounter difficulty. Multiply the number in the table by the number of characters in the party to get your budget. So if you want a low level combat for four level one players, the difficulty at low is 50. So you do 50 times four. So the example it gives a low difficulty encounter for four level one would be 200 XP total. With that, you could build any encounter with the following one bugbear warrior, two giant wasps or six twig blights. Significantly easier math. Yeah, seriously. Because before it had you like build the encounter and then you had to do like, I forget exactly how it works, but a a multiplication or something like that to. Oh, God, how did it even work? It was like you had to multiply it based on how many monsters there were present because more monsters means like it's more dangerous, even if they're not necessarily that higher of a CR or whatever. It was just. It's just a significantly easier one they've they've whipped up now. Granted. This this new one could be shit and not work very well. I don't know, but the math is a lot easier. I wonder, I kind of hope that this is what they use at the Wizards in-house game. Could be, could be. Because they always talked about having a different bespoke system than what we get. True, true. Uh, it says, uh, if you have many creatures, the more creatures in an encounter, the higher the risk that a lucky streak on their part could deal more damage to the characters than you expect. If your encounter includes more than two creatures per character, include fragile creatures that can be defeated quickly. This guideline is especially important for characters of level one or two. <laughs> LOL. Uh, so yeah, I just thought I th- thought that was interesting little tidbit that they changed the math and condensed down encounter like levels. Uh, they have the whole monster, the attitudes thing, the hostile, indifferent, or friendly. I I don't know. Is this like? Would you ever use this? I mean, I'm not entirely sure how it works right now. I mean, I know that it exists. It's been a thing for a while. Yeah, it's literally just like when you meet the creature, are they hostile, indifferent or friendly? And then you can like make an influence action check to adjust them up or down is kind of the crux of it. Oh, I mean, it's that's one of those things that I think a lot of players have already done. They've just codified it. So, like, will I specifically be using it? No. But is it good for new GMs? I'd say so. I don't know. It's 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 been there in 2014 since the beginning and nobody ever used it. Like, I don't know. Uh, They give you some some Mm -hmm. random tables for monster relationships and like personality stuff and some tactics. Mm, Monster relations. Ooh. Hmm. Some tactics they use, um, ambushing rules like prepared defenders and stuff, encounter pacing and tension with said pacing, as well as pacing out random encounters. For random encounters, it says uh, they have a couple of sections that say create urgency, drain the character's resources, establish atmosphere, provide assistance, reinforce campaign themes or a life of its own. I mean, most of those are kind of what I was already saying when we talked about random encounters. True. So Wizards agrees with me, and I'm right. You should listen to me. Mm, Yeah, right, bud. Yeah, right. (laughs) And then bringing it to an end, adventure rewards, some random treasure tables, which we were talking about before. Um, And then we have the five mini adventures that they put in this book to run. And when they say mini, they were not kidding. They are half a page adventures. Oh, wow. They're they're quick. One for level one, level two, level three, level five and level seven. 
The level five one is a full page. And the level seven one actually is even shorter. Yeah, these are very quick. Perkins did say that the intention of these is to be like a primer to show people how to create an adventure like on the fly and quick. So I think them being short little mini adventures like this makes a lot of sense. And they're very um, succinct. It's like the characters go here. This is the problem. These people ask for help. Boom, boom, like they're very quick, succinct, like easy for a new GM to be like, oh, I can do that, which is good because that's at the end of the day, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, right. For a new GM to run a tiny adventure and go, oh, this isn't that hard, right? That's how you get them to do it again. Oh, and there's even a little red dragon wormling in one of them that has his own little treasure hoard for the level three adventure. Oh, yeah. Adorable. With 400 GP. Damn. Look at him. Well, look at him. Little thief in the making. Little scamp. Little entrepreneur, if you will. Little scampity man. Just casually stealing and <laughs> everything people know and love. Yeah. And then after that is the creating campaigns chapter. I have not looked at this at all. I'm sure it's very dense. Uh, that is a really cool painting of a of a dragon turtle with a city on its back. Holy shit. That's dope as hell. Oh, what the f I really wish I had this book so I could <laughs> see the art that you keep fucking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um. What the hell is this talking? Oh, this is different styles of campaign. Yeah. Epic fantasy, sword and sorcery, heroic fantasy, mythic fantasy, intrigue, mystery, swashbuckling, war, crossing the streams. Oh, oh, like putting in sci-fi elements. That's funny. Uh, oh, it mentions. All, oh, interesting. It mentions all of the published settings. Dark Sun, Dragon... Dark Sun's mentioned, everybody. Dark Sun's not forgotten. It's oh real. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> it's alive. The first one on the list is Dark Sun. Uh, Dark That's Sun, amazing. Dragonlands, Eberron, Exandria, Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, Planescape, Ravenloft, Ravnica, Spelljammer, Strixhaven, and Theros. It gives you brief little blurbs about each of them. Cool. I almost expected them to mention Exandria. I literally said Dark Sun, Dragonlance, Eberron, Exandria. Oh, I'm sorry. I. Yes. My brain just turned off. Uh huh? Heroes make a name for themselves in Look, the world. You don't get to be mad at me after the fucking Gundam episode where you clocked out every two minutes. OK, I did. I did. It's true. Uh, heroes make name for themselves in a world made popular by the streaming show Critical Role. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, they called it up. It's funny. Uh, they got some mention of Session Zero, as I would expect. Your first adventure, another cool art piece of a really sick looking dragonborn. Burning a dead friend, it looks like. Oh, on a pyre. OK. Episodes versus serials. Getting your players invested. I mean, I'm just kind of flicking. OK, so d I know you weren't there for the 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 episode me and Matt did, but so did you know about the Greyhawk setting that was going to be in here? Yes, I had seen that on Twitter. Yeah, okay. So they were like, they were like, we're going to put, you know, this complete campaign setting. And then Chris Perkins was like, the whole point of the Greyhawk chunk of the book is, and it's, you know, in the DMG is going to be, um, it's, it's like, like a skeletonized a, frame for you to build on. Yeah. I feel like they kind of undersold it. Really? <laughs> it's 17 pages. Okay. All right. And like pretty dense information. I mean, I, I haven't read it th all the way through, but like it appears to be quite dense information. I mean, they have like months and festivals and how magic works in Greyhawk and like gods of Greyhawk and the city of Greyhawk. They've got the map of the city and then the map of the area, which they did talk about that part. They've got a couple of notable areas. What does that say? Uh, 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 Grand Citadel, the Great Library, 
uh, the Unearthed Arcana Magic Shop, Temple of the Far Horizon, Temple of the Radiant Sun. Uh, oh, this looks like another map of the zone. So, like, I, I feel like he kind of undersold it. Like, yeah, there's quite a lot in yeah, here. I mean, based on what he described, I had, I had expected some like. You know, fast and dirty lore breakdowns, uh, some descriptions of towns, maybe a map. Like like the Spelljammer chunk of lore. Yeah. Which was to say nothing. Basically yeah. nothing. Yeah. No, way more than that. Uh, Eastern Falaise. Oh, God. How do you say that? Eastern Falaise locations. And there's there's a big table on this page. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three notable locations. Hit him with with she with some very now very granted, very brief descriptions, but you have the name. So if you want to look up more, you can just look up more, you know, online. Yeah. Char? Didn't they, oh, they mentioned Char. Interesting. Wow. Uh, Char, uh, Char, the, uh, Char the place, I think, not the goddess. Uh, my brain autocorrected to a completely different character. Not that Char. <laughs> God not that Char. damn it. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Oh, wait, does it? Hold on. Wait a minute. Is it also explaining our own, the bone march? The bone zone. The bone, the bone zone. They mentioned they got a little art of the Tomb of Horrors. Go in there, it's awful. Yeah, there's like a lot in here. <laughs> and also, it's kind of cool looking because the entire Greyhawk section, the um, the like paper is like, obviously the paper is not different, but the uh, the art, like the background of the paper is like a different color and a different texture. So you can tell if you look at the book from the side of the pages, you can tell exactly where the Greyhawk section is because it's like got this oh, yellow cool. parchment tint to it. Yeah, and the yeah, art, yeah. the art, like, is like the 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 art, page art has like a little bit of a different vibe to it. Very cool. They have a whole shitload of gods. Oh my god, that is that is actually quite a long list of gods. Yeah, I like. My man Perkins really kind of undersold this bad boy. I'm going to be honest. I was expecting way less after he said that. So, yeah, that's yeah. Looking quite good on that one. So if you want to run Greyhawk, I mean, obviously there's Greyhawk was Gary Gygax's original setting, right? So, like, obviously there is a dick load of information that this book is never going to cover. But this is absolutely a jumping off point that you can look into all of, you know, any little bit afterward. Oh, hey, they mentioned White Plume Mountain. <laughs> so, like, yeah. It's a great jumping off point, for sure. That's pretty sick. And then the cosmology chapter, which I will probably never read, I'm gonna be honest. Because... <laughs> don't care most of the time but it's cool that it's in there there's actually quite a uh, quite a helpful art piece that shows you how the planes are like distributed I guess is the best way to put it there's the central bit in the middle of the wheel that is where sigil and everything is and the outlands and shit and then all of the different realms around the outside and then the astral plane and then it shows you where the ethereal is and then the plane of fire and ice and water and all that crap and then oh, oh yeah and the material plane between the Shadowfell and the Feywild so a very helpful diagram if you want to if you're actually going to utilize the planes uh, talks a little bit about doing some planar travel. Another mention of the River Styx. River Styx mention. Mentions the Blood War. Mentions Yggdrasil. That's a really sick art piece also of Yggdrasil. <laughs> Sorry, I keep doing that. The Abyss. The Layers of the Abyss. The Demon Web. Might be a in that. I'm wondering, uh, oh, wow, it's descriptions of all of the different planes also in here, which I was 
Sheesh. Oh my lord. That much, huh? Uh, more than I was thinking there would be. Yeah, goddamn. Ethereal Plane has like four or five chapters about it. Far Realm. Whole bunch of shit on the Far Realm. Was that page and a half on the Feywild? I mean, again, you know, this is one of those things, right? It's like, oh, but they didn't mention that one to a really sick painting of Avernus. Holy shit. God damn. I, I'm i sorry. I'm not trying to do this on purpose, but I, I'm i like seeing these as I go. I'm going to try and like. Um, that's a fucking dope. It's got like a huge volcano and shit. And then Zariel's big knife ship thingies. <laughs> In the foreground, and the the I'm sure it's very cool. The hell machines or whatever. What are those things called? The infernal engines. No, oh, infernal engines. Talks about the nine layers. I mean, yeah, like I was saying, the the a lot of this stuff is like, oh, but you didn't mention, you know, Jimbly Bibbly Bobbolo and his 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 butt canoe trumpet. And it's like yes, because you can't put every little fucking detail in a book like this, but. It gives you enough to start with, and if you really, really want to get deep in the sauce, you can get deep in the sauce on your own time, because the fucking internet exists these days, you know? So. It's a, ju- it's a good jumping off point. And then we have the treasures, the treasure chapter, which is not super different. Um, they did split up magic items into four typings. Arcana, which are gemstones, plus magic items of an eldritch or esoteric nature, armaments, which are coins or trade bars, plus magic items that are useful in battle, implements, which are coins, trade bars, or trade goods, plus magic items that focus on utility, and relics, which are art objects, plus magic items that have a religious origin or purpose. Uh, So they've kind of sectioned them off, which is cool. And I believe, if I remember correctly, Perkins was saying that... uh, some of the like higher CR monsters, it's going to say in the stat block for loot, it's going to say uh, roll on the armaments table for this monster. Oh, I, I like that a lot. That's- yeah. So like the specific monsters are going to be have specific types of magic items associated with them. Which is fun. Art objects and gemstones are the same, what you would expect. The potion potion miscability table is still in here. A little disappointed at this table, though. I don't know if this is the case before or not. I don't remember. But so it's a D100 table. The results of 36 to 90 just says both potions work normally. <laughs> OK, so 90 percent, like not 90 percent. Most of the time when I mix two potions together, they're just going to work normally. That's it. Fucking boring. What's the point it's of mixing very boring, them? Yeah, that's so thirty-six to ninety. Like, what is that percentage-wise? Hold on, what is that? Because what I mean, I guess it's just ninety minus thirty-six, right? Because the one hundred tip. Yeah, fifty-four percent of the time. No, oh, no, more than that. Fifty-six percent of the time, because you have to include thirty-six and ninety. Fifty-six percent of the time, they're going to do nothing. Or I mean, do you expect anything else other than wizards playing it safe? I, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Um, the magic item categories are still a thing. Armor, potions, rings, rods, scrolls, stabs, wands, weapons, wondrous items. As we mentioned at the top of the episode, magic item rarities and their value. Uncommon magic or common magic items cost 100 GP. Uncommon are 400. Rare are 4,000. Very rare are 40,000. Legendary are 200,000. And artifacts are priceless. Uh, Also, half the value if it's a uh, half the value for a consumable item other than a spell scroll. So that's how much those items cost. So consumables are are cheaper, but yeah there is still the magic item awarded by level table which quite frankly tells you to give players so many magic items it's kind of insane (laughs) uh you know 
they include consumable magic items in that list, I guess, but still. Like, at level 11 to 6, they tell you to reward 30 magic items. Total to the group. Uh, is that also, is that counting, like, potions as magic items? Yes, potions and scrolls count. Like I okay. said. Okay, well, so then, that okay, that that's actually not so bad, because then you get into the, like... Yeah. Baldur's Gate does this, where you get all the, the really cool the uh, disposable arrows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stuff like that. I get it. It just still seems like, I don't know, a lot. Uh, then there's the usual kit and caboodle about like charges, the next dawn, you know, items that refresh on the dawn, cursed items, magic item resilience. Uh, craft. They do have the crafting magic item rules in here. Crafting a legendary magic item. How many days do you think it'll take? Like a guess. decade and years. I mean, not that long. A year? Almost 250 days. Wow. This is halved for consumables. <laughs> um, if you're curious, so for crafting magic items, you have to have the arcana skill um, and the tool necessary to craft the item. So, for example, if you want to make armor, you need leatherworking tools, smith tools, or weaver tools, depending on the type of armor noted in the tool's description. So you have to have the right toolkit, and you have to have arcana proficiency. Um, if you want to add a spell to anything, uh, like if you want to make a wand of magic missiles, you have to have the magic missile spell prepared every day that you are crafting the item. Um, and then the item equals an amount of time and money based on the rarity as shown in the table. Uh, and then working days, you must craft for eight hours, which is kind of insane. <laughs> the cost in the table represents the raw materials needed to make a magic item. The DM determines whether appropriate raw materials are available. In a city, there is a 75% chance that materials are available. In any other settlement, 25%. If materials aren't available, you must wait at least seven days before checking on availability again. A magic item incorporates an item that has a purchase cost, such as a weapon or suit of armor. You must also pay the entire cost or craft that item using the player's handbook rules. For example, a plus one armor of plate mail, you must pay 3,500 GP or 2,000 GP and craft the armor as you have to include the price of the uh, of the plate mail armor in the purchase or the craft. So you just add, you know, the 1500 for the plate mail and then plus one armor is, I think, uncommon or whatever. And then or rare. It's rare. Yeah. Yeah. So you add the two. That's good. At least they like we actually had to be we talked about that in our, our campaign with Matt when I think it was Sam who wanted to upgrade his armor. We were like, wait, do we count the price of the armor? In? Oh, yes. Yeah, you do. Yes. That's good. <laughs> uh, a bunch of tables on a spe magic idol special features. I feel like nobody uses this. These tables. So like the items creator or intended user, the items history, the items minor property, the items quirks. I feel like nobody uses these, even though they are kind of fun. No, they're super cool. And ultimately, if you want to like talk about sheer optimization, they're great, right? To get the minor and major properties from like relics or no, no, cool. no. That's for artifacts. That's different. That's the different thing. Oh, this is the magic item special features. So it's just like the magic items creator or intended user. You know, dragon. The item incorporates precious metal and gems from a dragon's hoard. It grows warm within 120 feet of a dragon. Uh, elemental air. The item is half the normal weight and feels hollow. It's made of fabric. It is diaphanous, which I forget what that means off the top of my head. Um, and then like the history of it, like these are mostly flavor stuff. The minor and majors are for artifacts specifically. And yes, those are different. I don't feel like a lot of people use artifacts in general, though. I'm going to be honest. I mean, they should because they're cool and do I mean, some really yes, shit. But, but yeah. They're just a lot to deal with the thing. And then it talks about how to make a sentient magic. And then after the sentient magic item, you get all of the magic items listed A to Z. 
I will now proceed to read every Matt. No, I'm kidding. I will fucking kill you. I am the one who has to listen to this fucking episode all over again for the clip. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're not going to list off every magic <laughs> item. Um, there are some changes. There are many that are not changed at all. There's many that had very minor changes. Honestly, if you're trying to find, if you want to look for your own personal, oh, did they change this magic item? Your best bet is to just buy the damn book yourself because no one on YouTube. I mean, maybe someone on YouTube is going over every single magic item. I don't know. Some psychopath probably will. Probably some psycho, but I would recommend just yeah trying to search up the specific one you're curious about, because obviously there's a lot of fucking magic items in here and a couple new ones. Uh, yeah, lots of new art. That's, you know, which is fun. Yeah, they, they talked about uh, I'd seen people talk about how they added a lot more art for the magic items, which is cool. because They did. Yes, that's something I care about for no particular reason. A lot. They, oh, they added art for the charlatans die, and it's a little tiny die with a mouse standing over it. And the mouse has an eye patch. I kind of love that. I don't know why the mouse has an eye patch, but he does. Um, but this yeah, would be a perfect question for Sam. <laughs> the cube of summoning that looks Oh, you got art for the cube of force. <laughs> that looks like a child's toy. I love that. It, it's a little it's a little it looks like a little plastic box with a triangle, a square and a circle on the sides. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, you you do have the improved deck of many things with all of the new cards, or at least oh, I think most oh of them. Is that? No, I think it does all of them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does all of them. So, new and improved deck of many things. Yep, 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 yep. That's a fun one. Uh, a lot of this art, a lot of this art, I don't. Some of it's new, and then some of it I feel like isn't new. Maybe I'm tripping. Ah, uh, yes, the energy bow. Ever smoking bottle. That's cool. Did that one have art? I thought that one had. Art. I believe it did, yeah. Oh, a new art piece for the eye and hand of Vecna. They look like the, you know, Aven- Avengers style Vecna with gold gone. Uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, the last chapter is Bastions, which I think we might just do it our uh, it's its own episode on Bastions. <laughs> Because there's a whole lot going on there, and it needs, you know, time and attention, basically. Yeah. Um, and then after the Bastions is the Lore Glossary, which now I have to... There is actually quite a lot of good... Um, the... Ba-da. Nope, that's still Bastions. The Bastions section is quite long, actually. I mean, I would hope so. It's like a whole comprehensive new system. It is, yes. And then we have the Lore Glossary, which is, you know, basically what it sounds like. Um, it doesn't have Lolth, which I still cannot fucking fathom in my brain when she is literally on the cover well, at least on the cover of the alternate cover, not the regular one. But still, I didn't put. Yes, I think I find that so fucking bizarre. That so strange. Put- For context, Boo, Boo is in the lore glossary. Boo is a hamster. More precisely, he is a miniature giant space hamster, a species native to wild space that is both sapient and telepathic. Boo adventures with Minsk as well as the ha- as well as Boo adventures with Misk, as well as the hamster's ferocity, have given Boo legendary. S- oh, Boo is vent- Okay, I see. Have given Boo a legendary status, particularly in the city of Baldur's Gate. They mentioned fucking Boo and not Lolth. Odd, crazy. Again, Menzo Baranzin has is mentioned, but not Lolth. Like I, but Menzo Baranzin's it. I don't know. It's a weird thing. I don't know who I don't know how they decided who goes where I'm gonna be I'm gonna be one hundo with you. Uh, I mean, I, well, it's in alphabetical order. I don't know how they decided who's in the Lord Glossary. <laughs> so, yeah, 
So, uh, yeah. Oh, Illustrial Silverhand. Hey, that's the lady we're dealing with. Yeah. We should kill her. We already trash her house on a sessionly basis. It's true. It's true. What more can we do to this poor this woman? This band, Elminster, Dra- Dritz Duarden. Duarden. Hadar? They mentioned oh, fucking Dritz. Hadar? Hadar, the sentient, evil, fucking black hole? Hadar the Dark Hunger is an ancient stellar entity originating from the Far Realm. It appears in a cinder red dying star, barely visible in the night sky, and it siphons light from its minions to avert its own demise. Two widely used warlock spells invoke Hadar's power, uh, Arms of Hadar and Hunger of Hadar. And a few warlocks yeah. claim the Elder Evil as their great old one patron. It's basically a sentient fucking black hole. <laughs> yes. But lo- no wolf. <laughs> Wild. It's just really funny to me. I don't. It's very strange. Yeah. Use? Who the hell is Use? A Cambian and a son of Iggy Wilv. Iggy Wilv being Tasha. Uh, he's everybody's evil as his father. Oh, uh, Iggy Wilv and Graz. Oh, Graz. It's, yeah. He's every bit as evil as his father and as bent on conquest as his mother at her very worst. He rules a significant portion of Eastern Auric in the Greyhawk setting, and some fear that he aspires to conquer even more territory. Fucking Lord Soth is mentioned. I, My boy. Everwinter, Otelug, Ot Otto, Fandolin, the Prince of Frost, the Queen of Air and Darkness, the Raven Queen, the Rock of Brawl. They mentioned the Rock of Brawl, but not... Oh. <laughs> All right, bud. We're we're almost two hours and twenty minutes. I know. Thirty minutes. I know. In. It's Wrap just it still. I just. I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting. It's just wild to me. Anyway, that's the DMG. I'm sure we did not hit. You know, like I said, we're not doing a full review. So if you have some complaint about how I didn't read some specific section about tiddly winks or whatever, blah blah blah. I don't know. Take it up with HR, and by that I mean leave a comment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you'll get over it. Or you'll get over it. Yeah, that too. Uh, have a good night or a good morning or good afternoon. I don't know what time zone it is when you're listening, but have a time in a day. Bye-bye. Follow on Twitter. Peace, motherfucker.